This is where money meets politics. You're watching Political Capital. I am Karabole Tata. Coming up on today's show, South Africa is preparing to host the annual BRICS meeting later this month amid tough global conditions. We speak to Trade and Industry Minister Rob Davies about the effects of global trade spat between China and the US. And Gibbs Professor of Economics, Finance and Strategy, Adrian Seville, discusses the impact of South Africa signing on the dotted line for the African Free Trade Agreement and why Nigeria is delaying. But first, he is the newsmaker of the day, at least in the South African context. Julius Malema continues to be a source of great debate and sometimes contradiction. Today, the leader of the Economic Freedom Fighters held two press conferences. In the first conference, he discussed the banning issue of land and land expropriation in South Africa. And in the second press conference, a wide range of attacks from President Cyril Ramaphosa to Public Enterprise Minister Praveen Gwadan. Our reporter, Luba Balomashitlana, was able to sit down with the Commander-in-Chief of the Red Berets on the sideline of these two press conferences. Well, land expropriation without compensation means that the state will take everything and then own the land in South Africa. And that uh, all of us who want to use land for this or that issue will have to apply to the state and the state will issue us uh, with a permit to do whatever we want to do on the land. And uh, once the state becomes the custodian of the land, it will then redistribute it to all uh, for whatever people want to use it for. Which land should be expropriated and who does this apply to? It applies to everyone, all of the land, both rural and urban. The state becomes the custodian of the land in South Africa. Now let's go to the issue of uh, traditional leaders controlling a vast majority of the land like in KwaZulu-Natal and receiving uh, licenses or profits from mining licenses. Let's dip into that issue. Well, uh, that's why we're saying the state must own. The state will put mechanism in place in terms of land administration. We will integrate the traditional leaders into that uh, administration of the land. It must be democratized. It must uh, include everyone. It must not exclude people on the basis of race, on the basis of gender, on the basis of tribalism, uh, on the basis of ethnicity, uh, or even uh, you know uh, favoritism. Land issue must be administered to benefit everyone. Now let's take a look at the economy uh, of South Africa at this point, and let's take a look at foreign in investments. How we, how are you as the EFF planning uh, to 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 make deliberations so that it can also accommodate uh, economic factors like uh, foreign investments? We've got foreign investment on state-owned land now. Majority of the big projects in South Africa which are as a result of foreign direct investment, happen on the state land. And therefore, to suggest that a state-owned land will not attract FDIs is disingenuous. In China, they own their own land, is owned by the state, there is FDIs. Uh, in Mozambique, they own their own land, there are FDIs. So it is actually incorrect to suggest that state ownership of the land will threaten foreign direct investment. If anything, it will guarantee the security of tenure because government will say to FDI, you are entitled to this portion for this particular yes. Your view on the issue of the changing of the constitution to allow for land expropriation without compensation to go through? Well, we agree with it. We are championing it. It's, this debate is happening because of us. We are the ones who put the motion in Parliament, and now Parliament is implementing that which we said, that we must consult our people, let our people have input into this process, so that when we finally agree to expropriate land without compensation, the people were heard, their views were taken into consideration. But what is more important about this process in South Africa is that the land hearings never happened in Zimbabwe when they took the land. And the secondly, the land when it was taken in Zimbabwe it was given to individuals who are politically connected. In South Africa, we say the land must go to the state, not to individuals. Are you happy with the ruling party's contribution to the EFF's idea 
that it put into Parliament of land expropriation without compensation? Well, the ruling party is not participating effectively because they have abandoned politics, uh, they have abandoned political activism. They don't take this matter serious. I've not seen the, the high-profile politicians, I've not seen their national leaders coming to sit to listen to what the people are saying. They've become so elitist that they are no longer interested on the views of our people. The comments from the king, Zulu king, yesterday? Well, it is within his right. He's making a contribution into the whole land debate. The Boers have said worse things, worse than what the king said. They've even threatened civil war in our hearings. So the king is preparing for the public hearings which are going to be happening in KZN. If they want KZN removed uh, and becoming an independent state, it is within their right to make such suggestions. As to whether such suggestions will emerge, it's something else. But you can't stop people from thinking. They may think different from how you think, but it is within their right. We don't agree, by the way, uh, with the king. It doesn't mean we agree with the king, but we can't take away his right to express his strong feelings and views about the land question. The SARS issue, will the EFF be making uh, representations there? Well, uh, it's something that we're considering. We think that uh, every commission that is taking place in South Africa gives all South Africans an opportunity to express the views which they've always held. And as a result, uh, now platforms are created for us to, to share our views uh, with the uh, whoever is in government, because these are the processes which will help the president to have an idea what we're dealing with. Is the, is the commission not getting a little bit political, perhaps, or there is there no uh, conflict of interest somewhere with the EFF chairperson representing Moyani? What's your view on that? Well, chairperson can represent anyone. Chairperson has represented Gareth Cliff, even when we held a different view. Uh, it is his profession. Uh, but the process of a uh, commission of inquiry is political. You can see that uh, uh, Pravin Kotan and them are trying to uh, pay a revenge against those who are in power and dealt with them. So SARS is being used as a, as a tool that people can just play with and we don't agree with that. But secondly, because of Moyani's personal inquiry on his fitness to be a commissioner, we see that uh, commission as a double jeopardy on him because issues that are going to arise in his personal commission inquiry are already arising in this uh, 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 a commission, although it's not meant for him. It must be seen not to be, you know, uh, having a negative Im effect on him. It must, be, it must be democratic and we must not be seen to be unfair on him because once we see a person being treated unfairly that's when we have a problem what do you think could have been done differently in that particular commission they should have stopped the commission and allow moyanes process to finish and once moyanes process is done then continue with the commission because he will not say no uh, i run a risk of saying things here which may be used against me in my personal inquiry your view on the current economic climate in south africa well uh, things are not improving uh, we are degenerating, unemployment is becoming worse, uh, petrol is very expensive, uh, taxes are being increased, uh, um, um, the minimum wage becomes meaningless, um, and the employers are retrenching people because of minimum wage they can't afford. So it looks like we are heading for a crisis. Um, and. Uh, a quick state intervention is going to be necessary. What do you think that quick state intervention should be, perhaps? Well, uh, the president has got uh, all the powers to say to us he's removing certain uh, things from the uh, fuel levies uh, in order to reduce the price of fuel. And once you reduce the price of fuel, a lot of things will now become you know, affordable. The president should then be able to speed up the process of a, a state bank so that we can finance uh, industrialization in South Africa and any other projects which are aiming at stimulating the economy uh, of South Africa. 
uh, we need to speed up the process of land so that we accommodate as many people as possible, particularly on productive land, so that they can continue to grow the South African economy. That's how we'll deal with unemployment and speed up the process of growing our economy. Currencies, stocks and bonds in developing nations are closing out their worst quarter since 2015. These economies are grappling with growing global concerns, including weaker economic growth, tightening U.S. monetary policy and, of course, the escalating tit-for-tat -tit war of tariff and imports tariff between the United States, China and the EU. I was at the third ordinary meeting of the BRICS industrial ministers and asked our trade and industry minister, Rob Davies, about the impact of this global trade spat on our economy. Uh, what we're seeing is unilateralism. Uh, we're seeing uh, not just tariff increases, but tariff increases which have gone through WTO bindings uh, which have, in a number of cases in relation to steel and aluminium, uh, have already uh, breached uh, some of the AGOA preferences, uh, and also which have been applied contrary to the rules of most favoured nation. So they apply to some of us, but not to others of us. Uh, and I think that's the concern that we've got. But also, uh, we must understand as well that it's not just about this, uh, and then the retaliation which you get in from a number of other countries imposing tariffs on uh, other products uh, from the US and so on. It's not just about that, it's also what is being sought in the end of the day. Because this is to soften up for a series of negotiations mm -hmm. and negotiations in which the, the main objective is to, is to address the perceived imbalance in the global trading system to the disadvantage of the largest economy in the world. Well, frankly, for where we sit, we don't see that as the biggest uh, uh, problem in the world economy. The biggest problem in the world economy is that it is insufficiently attentive to the needs and interests of developing countries, as we all said uh, when we were in Doha in 2001. That business is not yet uh, finished. How have we been affected? Well, I think you all know we've been subject to the uh, national security motivated uh, increase in tariffs on uh, steel aluminium products. Um, we <coughs> argued that we are very small uh, suppliers into the US. Many of the lines of products that we introduce get further value addition in the United States itself and are benefit to companies there. Uh, the companies affected uh, employ about 7,000 people. Doesn't mean all the jobs will be lost, but it's just that those affected uh, employ 7,000 people. Uh, we made our representation uh, and uh, unfortunately um, our representation didn't succeed. I well, quantify the impact uh, on, um, of, the, of the, uh, the trade wars. Um, I, 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 I haven't got uh, any, any particular figures. Everyone's making uh, all kinds of comments. I think that the, uh, it depends how long they last. Uh, it depends on how many further rounds we get, but I do think that it, it, it does have the potential to, uh, you know, uh, weaken global growth. It does, it does have that potential. South Africa has become the latest member and a signatory to the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement. The agreement aims to create a single continental market for goods and services and also remove trade tariffs. South Africa initially declined to sign, citing that it needed more time for legal advisors to first go through the agreement and now will be passing the agreement over to Parliament for ratification. Here's what the Minister had to say on the process from now on. The significance of the uh, African Continental FTA is that it is uh, intended, of course, to boost intra-regional trade, which is at a very languishing, at a very low level. Uh, estimates could be between about 12% of total trade to, uh, I think the outer limit, probably about 16 to 18%, not more. Uh, and that's very small compared to, to other regions. But I think that behind that lies a vision of many of us that it is by uh, uh, creating a large uh, market and emulating what, for example, China is doing now, turning to its domestic market when uh, trade conditions become tight, uh, where, where it creates a large market that will allow the emergence of regional value chains 
and will assist us all to move up the value chain and uh, from our positions as producers and exporters of primary commodities, be they mineral or agricultural, uh, into more complex products, into uh, industrial products. Uh, and also uh, the Continental FTA is talking about services trade. So it's uh, services as well. But we, we don't anticipate uh, any inordinate delay uh, in uh, submitting the proposal for uh, ratification to Cabinet and then to Parliament uh, of the Continental FTA. Um, the reason we didn't sign in Kigali was that uh, we required in our processes in South Africa, we are required to submit any international or proposed international agreement uh, to uh, lawyers in the Department of Justice uh, and that there were some outstanding annexes that had not yet been legally scrubbed. So uh, we, we're, just not, we're just not able to sign an agreement under those circumstances. That has been cleared. We've signed. We don't anticipate uh, any uh, inordinate uh, delays. Um, uh, as far as uh, Nigeria is concerned, I'm aware that there's a, a big national debate in, in Nigeria. Uh, and uh, Nigeria will have to make its uh, own uh, sovereign decision. It's not uh, for, for me to comment on that, uh, except to say one thing. Um, I have heard that one of the concerns that's been raised is that Nigeria does not want to see uh, a whole lot of extra regional imports coming in uh, through the back door uh, in the uh, um, continental FTA. Um, I said before, I said it again, uh, it's a concern we share. We want to make sure that the rules of origin are robust enough to ensure that that doesn't happen. This is supposed to be about uh, trade between us in products that we produce not a back door for somebody else to uh, bring their, uh, their products uh, in. So I think that's the, that's the point. Our message is the message that uh, AGOA underpins a relatively balanced trade, agree a trade relationship between us, uh, one that is uh, of mutual benefit. Uh, and uh, to use a US phrase, we say it ain't broke, we don't think it needs fixing. Uh, so uh, that's our message. Uh, we will have to see uh, what they want to say. Uh, AGOA, uh, we are subject to AGOA eligibility until 2025. Uh, of course, there are reviews. There can be out-of-cycle reviews and all sorts of things like that. Uh, but we'll have to see where that, uh, where that takes us and whether the uh, Auto uh, uh, 232, as uh, a reference to US trade law, uh, whether uh, that applies to, to us uh, or not. After the break, we put the spotlight on the very same Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement and ask about the elephant, or rather the eagle, that's not signed on the dotted line yet. We speak Africa and why Nigeria is not signing the contract with Gibbs, Professor of Economics and Finance Strategy, up next. <laughs> 